How many ready for a word from the Lord? I just sense God is about to do something in this house. Because he said, when Jesus showed up at the synagogue, he said, I came to set the captive free. He was at church talking about, I came to set the captive free. There's some people still in bondage. I came to set the captive free. Because the kingdom of God is it's being shaken. But only the violent take it by force. Do I have any violent people in the house? I don't know if you come from Newark, there's some violence inside of you. He's, that's the violence was meant for God and in the kingdom of God. And so we're going to, I'm, I'm going to just take a couple of minutes of your time and bring something that uh, the Lord put in my heart this morning. And uh, if it's your first or second time, we want to say a welcome home. If you're watching us from YouTube and it's our first time, welcome, welcome, welcome home. And today, I will be speaking from the movies. Which is a very awesome topic for me because I, I just see Jesus and I see messages and everything I watch from cartoons to regular shows. Um, and secret in their eyes, I don't know, did anybody see the movie? Yes. Wow. That's an awesome movie of what not to do. Here it goes. You want the lesson from that? That's what you don't do. Because that movie to me is so profound because the first time I watched it, at the end I was like, wow. The reason that she was aging was because she kept something in the dungeon. She had something inside that she was captivated and she didn't want to let go. See, the problem is that when someone does something to you, you want what? Vengeance. I don't need nobody to handle this. I'm going to handle it. They did it to me. It's me and you. There's an echo on here. Do you have a, is there another mic? Mic here? Yeah, this one, I just feel like I'm, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I hear myself three times after. <laughs> uh, um, can, you, can you fix this one, Mr. Rui? Mr. Rui? Okay. I think he fixed it. Hello. All right, here we go. Oh, that's better. And the thing when somebody does something to us, we get offended. Offense is the number one thing the enemy uses. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that again. Offense is the number one thing the enemy uses because he uses, he, he needs people to enter into your heart. He can't go in there automatically, he uses people. Have you ever uh, heard of the, of the movie The Trojan Horse? The Trojan Horse, the enemy got inside this gift and the gift went inside and the reason the gift was given was so the enemies could go inside the gift. And so the enemy uses the people, he needs people to operate and his biggest, watch this, his biggest quest is your heart. His biggest quest is to get inside the system so that he can manipulate the system and, uh, and let his attributes and characteristics flow through you. Because when you have an emotion and you're offensive and you're mad and you're angry and you're hating, those characteristics are not from the kingdom that you come from. You're promoting a kingdom that you don't belong and you got to recognize. Come on. You got, you got to recognize. A lot of times I... Uh, by the fruits you'll recognize them. Everybody's like, oh yeah, by the fruits I'll recognize them. But Jesus was talking to the disciples so they can recognize what's inside their hearts. It wasn't so much of recognizing on the outside. It's recognizing, hey, what's coming out of your mouth is coming out of your heart. You may not know and understand it, but if you watch the way you talk, you can find out what's inside your heart. Yeah. See, subconscious means we don't know that what's going on in there, but there are characteristics that shows us. And Jesus very easily shows us. It says, hey, by the fruits you will recognize them. And the thing is that the fruit is just only a byproduct. The problem is not the fruit. The problem is the root. And unless we find out and understand where the root is coming from, we're going to keep giving fruits. And we're going to keep promoting the wrong kingdom. And when we promote the wrong kingdom, we get the wrong fruits. It's not fruits. They're, they're thorns and thistles that don't not only hurt you, but hurt others. And so we got to recognize that there's certain things. This is war here. If you signed up for a, cru a, a cruise, a carnival cruise, this is not a carnival cruise. This is a battleship. And I'm just talking to a couple of you because understand that this is a battleship. I love carnival cruise lines and I'm chilling when I go there. 
But I understand that the minute I say yes to God, I got into a battleship. And in this battleship, the enemy is not my brother or my sister or my past. There's only one, one enemy. The Bible says the first time is mentioned enmity, which is enemy, which is hatred, is when God tells them, George, the seed of the, uh, of the virgin will have enmity towards the seed of the enemy. That the enmity and hatred and anger was not designed for brothers and sisters or people. It was designed for the enemy. And once you understand who you're fighting for and who you're fighting, you're going to understand the war is changing. Tell your neighbor the war is about to change. Because you... Because you got to understand this, you're here now, the minute you leave out of here, your thoughts, which is about 60,000 thoughts a day, that's your battlefield. Sometimes we don't even know where these things come from. We don't understand where that, have you ever said something like, where would that come from? You surprise yourself. Like, you know, did that just come out of me? Or somebody videotapes you and it shows you, you're like, that's me? That's you? Right? Because the thing is that things that are in our hearts, we don't know. And above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of what? Wellspring of life. The thing is that we never really got taught how to guard that and, and how to handle that and how not to allow things to go into our hearts. But today, hopefully I can open up some wisdom for you because I always say the only way the things you look at are going to change is if you change the way you look at it. Yeah. Perspective is everything. Knowledge and understanding, it brings into in, in, intentionality. Intentionality is that you're living a life godly with intentions. Like, I know that I'm here today and I'm going to go to glory tomorrow. I'm not questioning and hoping and asking God. God had given me authority to handle a couple of things. If I'm going to handle something, I'm going to handle some stuff within myself. I don't got no time to be judging nobody else. I ain't got no time to look at nobody else. I got enough issues in myself. And But I know that as I handle that because God has given us the power to handle certain things. You got to understand that there's certain things that are in your heart that God has, has empowered you to take it out. And you're saying, God, you take it out. And he's like, I gave you the power and the authority. When Jesus dies at the cross, he gives us power and authority over the enemy. If he's in your land, if that giant is in your land, God is saying, you got a rock in your hand. All you need to sling is that rock once and bring down that giant. Come on. God has given you everything you need. I'm telling you right now. You're not lacking anything. What you're lacking is understanding. If you have a well, unless you have a bucket, you'll never get the water. Woo. So I'm about to give out some buckets today because there's some glory inside of you that God wants to bring out today. It's understanding that we have certain things that we have to do and, and deal within with ourselves. And so my subtitle call today is Entangled, and I'm coming out of Hebrews chapter 12 because some of us are just entangled in some things. And to be entangled means to be caught up. Entanglement is caused to become twisted together or with or caught in. That's an entanglement. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, the Amplified Version first. And then we'll go to the TPT because TPT just have a way to say anything. <laughs> it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a so great a cloud of witness, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight. Some people are going to lose some weight today here. There's some things you're carrying around that's giving you. You're huffing and puffing because you you're carrying some stuff that you shouldn't be carrying. And the sin, not plural, just one, sin which so easily and cleverly, what? Entangle us. Let us run with endurance and active persistence at the race that is set before us. And he goes in TPT. There's another version. It says, for, as for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and sin we easily fall into. Yeah. Then, everybody say then. then. We will be able to run life's marathon race with what? Passion and determination for the path has been already marked for us. Come on, somebody. So entanglement means to be connected, to be in the midst. You could be entangled in a love affair, and that's just three people all mixed up in one big entanglement. 
and you become that. Entanglement, in a sense, is when you are so intertwined with something that it becomes you. Offense, here, 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 here's the big thing. Offense is the biggest thing the enemy has used from the beginning of time to now. And what offense is, because a lot of people say, oh, you have sin in you. Offense is sin. And unforgiveness is a sin. And the problem with unforgiveness is that it is the enemy within. The enemy within is not fighting from the outside. You're going, I'm fighting this devil, I'm fighting that devil. It's, it's the things that you have not dealt with within that allows you to be enslaved. In other words, you are entangled in that sin because you are entangled in that unforgiveness and it blinds you. It doesn't allow you to see clearly because there is a log inside your eye. And you're trying to take somebody else's log off when you yourself have a log. And he says, take out the log so that you can see clearly. Sometimes we don't see clearly because we have some bones in our yard. We have some skeletons in our yard. If you look, if you watch the movie, the, the most impacting part of the movie was the fact that she was living a life and she had no husband, she had no kids, she had a job and her face was all the way to the floor. I think she had wheels on it. That's how long her face was. And when they show her 13 years later after what happened, he said, you look like you aged a million years. Because understand that while you are harboring something in your dungeon, while you have bones inside your dungeon, if you watch the movie, you got to understand she was feeding him. So in other words, it was costing her to have those bones in the... Woo. It cost her. She had to go and feed him. And somehow she was getting vengeance. But the only one, the only one that was getting vengeance was not even, not even him. There was no vengeance. There was nothing paid. She didn't, and even in the movie, she was like, oh, I don't want. They were like, you should let's go kill him. Because they thought they had another guy that was in the guy. She really knew what was going on. She says, no, that's too easy. He's got to pay the price. You see, sometimes when we hold on to unforgiveness and someone owes us something, we think that we're going to hold on to it. Like, if they're going to pay, here, I'm going to tell you a secret today. They're not going to pay you. They're not going to pay you. The only one that's paying for that is you. A wise man was asked one time, what is anger? And the man replied, it is the penalty you pay for someone else's mistake. We see it in the movie because the lady was aged. She had no hope for anything. She would have had no zeal. She had no relationship. She had nothing going. She had a bland life, but she was getting vengeance in her eyes. And the only one that was being deteriorated in this whole thing, it was only 13 years that went by before the man came back, was her. Because you got to understand that unforgiveness is a debt that you're never going to collect. And our job is not to be collectors of debt. Why? I tell you why. If you have heard here the message of grace, you understand that grace has given you more than enough for you and everything that you've done. Then who are you to hold on to the debt of someone else? Who are you to go and grab somebody by the neck that they owe you five dollars when God has forgiven you for a trillion? Yeah. Woo. See, sometimes we forget really quick. The grace is for what? Giving. Giving. If it's anything you get from this church here is that grace is for giving. It's not for keeping. It's not just you and you and don't give out. You got to give out because God has empowered you with the ability to give, to forgive, right? Because you've been forgiven. It is a duty for us, right? You have giants and you're, everybody here, and I'm talking about traumas and situations that happen in your life. Your, your father left you, you got molested. All these things are bad or wrong and happen to us. And somehow we want to hold back and hold it and, and look for the person to fall or die or something happen to them. At the end of the day, we are the one paying the penalty for holding that. Because God is saying, hey, let go of that. In other words, God let go in his hands the forgiveness in heaven so that you can let go of the people here. That is true. When he, when he goes up and shows up in church and says, I come to set the captives free. It's because he was going to do something at the cross. The Bible says at the cross is the power of God. At the cross, he defeated everyone. At the cross, it says the enemy's guns were taken away. The weapons were taken away. Why? Because forgiveness is the weapon that God has given you. It's the biggest weapon that you have. And the only way you're going to get rid of the giants that are inside your yard, that inside, and I talk about the heart, is forgiveness. That's how you, we take them out. It says only the pure in heart will see God. How many people want to see God? 
pure in heart, you can't have nothing in there other than God. Come on, somebody. You can't have some resentment and some anger and, and some... No. Why? The, the heart is not meant for us to hold that. In Romans chapter 8, it says, vengeance is mine. That's God. That's New Testament. Well, George, but that's kind of rough. And he's talking about those have done you wrong. Let me handle it. The thing is this, that we don't want him to handle it because we want to handle it. We want vengeance now. We want it right now. I want my money. It's my money, and I want it now. You seen that commercial? I want. <laughs> I, I want. He did. They did this to me. They owe me. Yes, it's wrong. Yes, it's they. they in life, it's gonna be. It's gonna be things that we go through. There's traumas. There's hurt. There's pains that we go through. But at the end of the day, it's hurt people hurting people. And if you get caught up in the hurt, you're gonna be one hurting others. Because hurt only produces hurt. But when you are, when you are healed and, and forgiven, I, I call that the grace goggles. It's the ability to see people through the grace goggles. Did they do you wrong? That's right. But guess what? It is not them that is doing it. It's what's inside of them that's doing it. If there was a puppeteer with a puppeteer and, and he and gave you a finger, are you going to go hit the, puppete- the, the puppet? No, because you'll be like, hold on. There's someone pulling the strings. Come on, somebody. And who we are against is the one pulling the strings. How would it look you kicking the, it's like, I ain't got nothing to do. All they're doing is being pulled. And when somebody comes against you, just look at it like this. This is the perspective I want you to change. Is to look at them as there's someone else pulling the strings. And he's trying to draw you into a thing that you're going to lose. Because the minute you start hating someone, you lost. Matter of fact, God said this. If you have hatred in your heart towards your brother, you're a murderer. In other words, you got some bones. Come on. Bones only come with somebody who's murdered. This is how profound it is. is it? And, and, and I could say it's simple, but it's not simple. Right? Because when someone comes in your face and looks at you or they do something, you're looking at the person. Like, you did it. You could have stopped it. You could have done this and that. But at the end of the day, it is the enemy operating through people. And he operates through people in hearts. And the only way he can operate in someone through their hearts is through hurt. Hurt is the entrance. Offense is the entrance to allow the enemy into your life. Here goes the biggest spiritual battle that you're ever going to have is this. We could, stand, we could spend here 10 hours fighting this spirit and that spirit. But when you go to your job, the biggest, the biggest war you can win is if when your enemy is coming against you, you feed them. Let's talk about spiritual warfare. Come on. It might not look like the one you think. Spiritual warfare happens every day when someone gets in your face. Because <laughs> remember, it's someone pulling the strings. And all he wants you to do is cross the line. Because when you cross the line, you cross the line into darkness. And that is his territory. But if you stay in the light, come on, somebody. If we stay in the light, if we stay in the light, then he has no access to us, right? Uh, I remember watching I Am Legend. That's another awesome movie. Anybody seen I Am Legend? It's an awesome movie about darkness and about this big, crazy virus that comes out. And, 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 and it was, um, what's his name? Uh, Will Smith is the, the character, and, and he's the only one left around, and he's running around, and all of a sudden, he's trying to get a cure. And when he's trying to get the cure, he goes and takes one a girl from, from the ones that are infected so he can test them out. And he takes somebody a girl. He took somebody a girl. So that guy got mad. He's like, oh, you took my girl. <laughs> That's my girl. So because he did that, the, the, the enemy was after him. And so he noticed the enemy. Watch this. This is so good. You go watch that movie too. He was in a, in, in, in a, a rental, a, a video rental place. They don't have that no more, I don't even know what to call it. Papa said, wow, you just told me your age. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so he's in a blockbuster, he's the only one there, and they got a bunch of, uh, of like dummies all standing around. He's talking to them like this, like, hey, he was trying to do the best he can, he was the only one around. So he's talking to this, to this, to this, uh, to these mannequins, and he's all friendly. And there was one called Fred. Fred, right? That was his boy. So the enemy was watching because he noticed that he had a relationship with a dummy. But the point is that there was some kind of feelings. So you know what Fred did? Fred went and took, I mean, uh, the enemy did. They took Fred and put him somewhere else. And now Will Smith is looking at, at Fred and like, what? Who you at? Who brought you here? So he's arguing. We're back to back. So the point of this is that in the movie, as long as he was in the light, he was good. Mm-hmm. But when darkness came, he had to hide. Yeah. Yeah. Because if he was caught in the darkness, they will rip apart pieces. Yeah. 
So the enemy knew if I could draw him in. If I could draw him into the darkness, I'm going to get him. He took my girl. So the puppet, the, the, the thing is there, and he's arguing, and he goes up to him, and the enemy has set a trap. Mm -hmm. And so as he's going to Fred, because he's emotionally attached, understand that the enemy's always going to use someone that you're emotionally attached with. Yeah, yeah. As he's going, he gets caught up. And the point was to get there for the darkness to come so they can get him. And if you know, if you know the movie, the, the darkness coming, he, he comes off. But this is the point. Ready? Ready? The enemy will always use someone that's close to you to draw you into darkness. Because if he can have you pass that line, if he can have you pass that line, now you're not operating no more in light. Come on. Yeah. You're operating in darkness, and you're no good at darkness. The enemy is really good at operating in darkness. The thing is that when you cross that line, you're allowing your heart, watch this, you're allowing your heart to open up and give him access. Because we understand that it is not Fred. It is the one behind Fred. But he'll use Fred. And how many times Fred has hurt us? If we look back, whenever you hate someone, it's like, I want time. You love them. It's, there was some emotional attachment that something happened, and you got pulled into this warfare, and now the enemy is using that. But the thing is that when you, when you cross that line, watch this. When you cross that line, the one enslaved is you. You're the one enslaved because you have given them access and it's something inside your heart now that is operating through you. This is, this is not a loop. This, this is powerful. This is Luke 4. Uh, Luke 6, 41, 42. He's talking about what's in your eye, right? There's, there's a log in your eye. He says, why do you focus on the flaws of someone else? life and, and, and fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own life. Like, how could you say to your friend, here, let me show you where you're wrong when you are guilted and even more than he is. Right? So he's like, well, how, do you, how, could, how could you go and help someone take out something out of their eye when you yourself have something in your eye that, that is blocking you from seeing the truth? Because understand this, that every time you allow the enemy to operate in your life, your lenses and perception on how you see people change. The more trauma you have and the more things that happen in your past, your perception on how you see things is because you have something in your eye. Tell your neighbor, take it out. Take it out. It, it continues to be you are overcritical, splitting hairs and being a hypocrite. You must acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them before you will be able to deal with the blind spot of your friend. I, why? It's so easy to see somebody else's fault, but it's not so easy to find our own. And here he's saying, hey, why don't you deal with the, with the things that you're dealing with so that when you can see clearly, because your heart is pure, then you help somebody else. But meanwhile, work on you. Work on you. <laughs> right? Look at how it says it in the, new, in the King James Version. It says, and why behold this thou, the moat that is in brother thy, above perceiveth not the beameth that is in thine own eye, either how cost thou, say thy brother, brother let me pull out the moat, everybody say moat, that is in thine eye, and when thyself beholdeth not the beam that is in thy own eye. I don't know how they got this. I, I have a harder problem trying to figure out the word than to figure out what it's saying. But I didn't know what moat was. And, 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 it's, and it's crazy how sometimes you see a word in the King James where you're like, what is a moat? So I looked up what moat is. And this is what moat is. Any small dry body. In other words, take out the skeletons you have in your own yard to deal with the skeletons of somebody else. Because once you deal with the skeletons in your own eyes, then you can see clearly. What is he talking about? And Jesus is so awesome because in all his parables, he's always trying to bring somebody somewhere. And he's telling, hey, there's something that's going on inside because your eyes are the windows of your soul. And if your window is dirty, then you can't see clearly. Have you ever tried to drive a car while it's raining and you have no wipers? Yes, I, that's right. I have a hoop and it still happens. It's the worst thing. 
<laughs> I was ready to put a string. But as soon as I pull that side, I pull this side. <laughs> Quit the comments. But <laughs> when when your window is not clean. Can't say clear. Have you ever tried to look through a window that's broken? Nothing makes sense. And we try to make decisions with broken glasses helping others when our own glasses are broken. And they, you give advice based on your broke. You give advice from your own brokenness to someone who they're bad enough as it is. And so that's why Jesus was like, hey, listen, I need you to take out those bones you have inside your cell. That you, you have some things inside your heart. You, you have some people. You have some bodies. You know, in, in Newark, when they say you got a body, that means you, you killed somebody, right? You know, how many bodies you got? <laughs> but we look at it spiritually, it's like how many bodies you got? How many people you're holding in there? How many people you're keeping inside your own heart? And you're saying, no, they did this, they did that. And understand this, that this, I've been studying for the last 20 years scripture, and I've understood one thing, that a lot of times, this brokenness here, ready for this? This brokenness doesn't start with the friend you met or, or the girlfriend you had. or the, It usually happens at home. Brokenness is always foundational. Brokenness means there's a broken relationship with the mom. There's a broken relationship with the dad. There's always something that started where the enemy is now in camp. That is called a root. It's in camp. And now every time you see something, you see it through the lenses when you was broken when you was eight. Come on, somebody. And sometimes we don't want to go that, that far back because we don't want to deal with our emotions. But again, we're telling God, God, please, I'm tired of being here. Take this out. And he's like, I gave you everything you need to take them out. You have that body? Because you want that body. You think that somehow you're going to see vengeance and that they owe you something, they're never going to pay you. And we're scared to go, hey, God, I'm going to leave this to you. you. You're the one that could judge this and with all respect the best way. I can't do this. Matter of fact, this is too heavy for me to, to carry, and I'm leaving this weight here on the altar. I'm letting it go. I'm forgiving them. I'm letting go. I don't want, I'm, that's it, I'm... You know, I think it costs like, wait, $65,000 to keep somebody in jail. <laughs> and if they go out and get a job, they make 30. <laughs> so it costs us, the taxpayers. Yeah, yeah, they, that's right. Yeah, they, they did that. Go, go to jail. Guess who's paying? $65,000 per inmate to keep them behind jail. And the taxpayers the ones paying. So it is with us. That's, yeah, they need to be free. Like, go get a job. Go to McDonald's or something. Go get your own. But understand this. This is the, the greatest thing. And, and, and to me, when I come here on a Sunday, to me, I'm kind of like a general who's been at war for so long that I got my badges because I, I've defeated the enemy. So I get to stand up here and tell you, hey, this is how you defeat the enemy. I can't fight your war, but I'm going to tell you how you're going to win. That's why we come here, to get built up, encouraged, and edified. Why? We need, we need instructions on how the enemy is taking and stealing from us. I don't know about you, but if somebody's stealing from me, I need somebody to tell me how to catch them. Put a camera, do this, do that. What, what do I do? Because they keep stealing. The enemy comes to what? To steal, kill, and what? Destroy. He's not going to stop at stealing. He's in a vengeance. He's in a mode to do something, right? And we got to be equipped to understand that I'm not in a cruise ship. I'm in a battleship. If not, then it's going to be the same circle. If, and if, if you get a set of instructions and do nothing with it, don't come the next Sunday and complain about the same thing. Because God has spoken when you haven't moved. Come on. <laughs> this morning, he's saying, I need you to move on this. Yeah. I need you to take that person, your mom, your dad, whatever. I need you to let it go. And let it be. Vengeance is mine. Yeah. Vengeance is mine. Who are you trying to, what, what, you're not making a thing out of it. Yeah. They probably don't even remember they did it. How about that? But you're still holding them there and you're paying the tab. Because every time you have someone inside your cell, you're the taxpayer paying for it. You're the one paying the price. Whether it's in your, in your relationships, whether it's in your household, whether it's in your next generation, somehow you're paying for it. And I don't know about you, but the Bible says that we go from glory to glory. I'm expecting glory to glory and I'm going to follow instructions. Because at the end of the day, he tells us what to do. He's not going to do it. I'm sorry. He's not going to do it. 
He allows us to say, hey, this I need to be removed from my life. In Genesis 4, this, this is not new. Understand this. This is not new. What we're facing, how the enemy works, this is not new. It started in Genesis in the beginning and it's still happening now. Except that in Genesis there was no Jesus. Here now we have Jesus that paid the price and allowed us to give us the ability to be forgiven so that we can forgive. That is the biggest, biggest instruction that you can get from here. And if you get that, that alone will take you from glory to glory. Because the biggest, the biggest obstacle the enemy uses is offense. And if he can get you offended and caught up in your emotions, he's got you. Now, do we get mad when someone does something? Yeah, there's something called a refractory time. What's a refractory time? Great at question. Refractory time is that he got me angry, I'm angry, and then, boom, okay. Now I'm going to let him go. It's not to live on an emotion. You can feel an emotion, but not live in an emotion. There's a big difference. difference. Because when you live in an emotion, you are entangled. If, you, if someone did something and you go tell your friends, and the next week you're calling your other girlfriend and telling the story, and then you're calling your aunt to tell them the story, and three weeks later you're still calling family members about your story, you are entangled. <laughs> Hashtag, just know now that if you continue saying the thing over and over, you are entangled. What is entangled? You are all in that emotion. And that emotion is not from God. And it's only going to birth what? Thorns and thistles. It's not going to birth anything from God. Yes. Understand that we have to what? We have to see what's coming out of our hearts and what's coming out of our mouth. That is the biggest thing because God has empowered us. Like if I see, I'll give you an example. If I see something and I feel something towards somebody, I deal with it. Why? Because I know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to entertain this. I'm not going to, if I feel someone's has something against me, I'm, I'm going to face them. Let's deal with this. Let's, let's hug. Let's, let's, let's do the, the high five. Let's just, let's just deal with it. Right? Why? Because I know that if I harbor it any longer than I should, then I'm fathering something that later I will have to. And what I mean by father, watch this. What I mean by father is an emotion is a baby. It's a thought. But as you keep giving it attention, you are fathering something that later on is going to be undisciplined and you got to pick up the toys. Because this starts operating inside of our hearts. And when it starts operating inside of our hearts, now it's taking control over your characteristics and you got to deal with the characteristics of something that you fathered. Woo. Every thought that you spend time on, you are the father or the mother. Anytime you're thinking of something someone did, you are fathering some. You're giving it milk, and it's going to grow to, to its size, and it's going to go where? It, it doesn't stay here. It goes into your heart. It's where it's going to go. That's the way it is, whether good or bad. It's just the way we're designed. So if I know that my design is that if I keep thinking of something, I become it, then why would I think on negative things? Why would I keep thinking on someone and worst case scenario on people? I don't have time for that. We are wired to look at everything the wrong way, especially if you're Spanish. I always say that if somebody falls down the stairs, they broke their neck. Like, we're really exaggerators on worst case scenarios. It is so true. She's in the hospital. She died of what? Like, no, she's in the hospital. But that whole, that same negative thing is against people. If people say something, what are you trying to say? We, we always go to the negative part of it. That's the way we're wired. But we need to take, take control of it and start looking at it the positive. Because, again, in Christ Jesus is the cross. What's positive is the cross. Let me go here, and, I, and I, I'll wrap up in a couple minutes, I promise. Genesis 4, uh, chapter 5 and 7, so I'm bringing this uh, to an understanding of the first people that were here on earth. It says, but for Cain and his offering, he gives an offering, he didn't like it. Uh, Abel gave an offering, the, the God liked it, and here comes jealousy, and he's just mad, right? So, but for Cain and his offering, he had no respect. So Cain became extremely angry, indignant, and he looked annoyed and hostile. I say he was a little offended. And he looked annoyed and hostile, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry? Why are you getting all riled up? And, and like, and like, and like, why do you look annoyed? So he was not only angry, he was annoyed. If you do what is well, believe me, and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to God, will you not be accepted? Is that a second part to this? And if you do not do well, watch this. Look at the warning God. Now, he is talking to God. I want you to understand when you read this, God is talking to him. There was a relationship. He was in a place of peace that surpasses all understanding. And he's allowing the enemy to penetrate. And he goes, and if you do not do well, but ignore my instructions, this is what happens with it, right? When you ignore instructions, sin 
crouches at your door and his desire is for you to be overpower you, but you must master it. In other words, you can be angry, right? So what happened with Cain? He was angry and he continued to be angry. And he said, hey, hey, watch this. Sin is at your door. And sin wants to come in and it wants to master you. You're not going to be mastering it. It's going to master you. Why? It's going to operate through you. It's going to master you. But do what's right. And then he if we keep reading the story, he would rather, watch this, he would rather leave the presence of God than to, to let go of the anger. Later on, we know we killed him. Because <laughs> first is an offense, then you're angry, then you're resentful, right? And then you go all the way up to murder. He murdered him before he murdered him. When he stood in the anger, in his heart, he murdered him. That's why he says sin wants to crunch and master you. And so when he mastered him and he killed them, he, he said, why are you telling me I have to leave? This is too much to pay. But already sin was in him, so he would rather leave the presence of God than to go and let go of what was in his heart. And that is so much the thing that happens. Again, look, offense took him out of the presence of God. Offense led them away from a place that he was being fed. Offense got him away from church. Offense got him away from relationships. Offense, offense will cooperate in someone and destroy till there's nothing else. Why? The enemy comes to steal, kill. We have to be aware because this is every day. This is happening all the time. As a matter of fact, sometimes you, have you ever said uh, that you forgave somebody until you saw them again? You thought you forgot. You forgave him. But I, I dealt with this. Obviously, you didn't deal deep enough. Because if you if you go to a party, right, and it's thumping, right? Where's my, where's my party? Uh. <laughs> no, that's if you go to a party and you're all smiley, you got your high heels and you got your nice suit and you like, you were so excited to go there. You was waiting for it like all week. You was like, okay, wait for the party, right? And you, you're going over there all happy until you see her. <laughs> Hashtag, if someone could take your joy, they mastered you. You didn't master it. It mastered you because if it's willing and is able to take your joy, it has more power over you than you have it over. Sin is crouching. <laughs> Sin is crouching at the door and wants to seize you and master you. Right? And this is something that happens all the time. This is something the enemy is never going to stop. It's his number one weapon. How's that? I'm giving you the number one weapon of the devil. It's not your boss or your husband or your wife. No. <laughs> it's offense. Because if he can operate and pull you into darkness, you lost. It'll take you, twist you, and take you in a different direction. It's like a plane that's on autopilot to go to, to the glory zone. And he comes in there and takes that plane and shifts it somewhere else and ends up in a, in a desert. That's how easy and so small and so quick. Because the enemy is good at what he does. He's good at manipulating. And understand that when something is in your heart, it manipulates you. It allows you to... Have you ever had an argument within yourself and you're huddle, like a huddle with you? Like, how could he do that? Who he think he is? But he, don't you know how I am? Do you know where I come from? You know what? You don't, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> you get all riled up. <laughs> you're like, what? 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 Oh, you not know. But this is you within you. Nobody. Nevertheless, because, you know, you look for co-signers after that. You tell somebody when they did, and then you get a co-signer. No. Oh, forget about it. Wow, well, that's all you need. No, they didn't do that. What? They, they did that. Now you're at a whole different level. But now, you, you know, you could be addicted to anger. It's an emotion. It's an emotion. It feels good. Because you feel like you got, you got the right. Like you, you got the right to say this, and, and you, you're, you're, you're validating yourself, and everybody else is co-signing. Man, if you get two or three co-signers on a validation, forget about it. You keep telling everybody, yeah, this story is good. I feel good every time I say it. And they high-five me. Woo, the rush. Man, wow. who do they think they are? They don't know who I am. It is I. Sometimes we think too much of ourselves. The Bible says don't think too highly of yourself. 
Oh, how could it disrespect me? That's pride. That's pride. Who do they think they are to, to tell me? That's pride. That's not of God. God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. Pride is the, the, the thing the enemy uses the most. Because it's like a disrespect. When someone disrespects you, how could you disrespect me? I'm a man. I have beard. I have hair. Thinking too highly. <laughs> the thing is that, understand this, that in all this, if you ever do it again, you're ruined because you're going you're gonna to hear my voice. In all this, in all this, you're allowing the enemy a foothold to your life. A foothold, back in the day, I was always in sales, so you knock on doors, and in training, they'd be like, okay, when they open the door, you put your foot there. So when they try to close it, he could still talk. So I would put my foot there. I used to sell Kirby's. I put my foot there. Yeah, but the Kirby is this and it does shampoo. Clint. Oh, my toes all twisted. Yeah, but listen, uh, right now we have a sale for $49.95 monthly for, no, get out. No, but you don't understand you need this. <laughs> and I will stay there until they open the door. That's what happens when you give the enemy a foothold. He's going to stay there until you let him in. And he's going to whisper, because you don't have to be too loud. He's like, man, they shouldn't have done that to you. Who do they think you are? Like, they're overlooking you. Like, you, you're going there because you, you want to get better, and they're overlooking you. Like, the enemy has a, and the thing is, if you go into this huddle, you'll get winded up all by yourself. And by the time you see the person, you're at a 10. Because for that whole hour, you was babying this thought, and you was allowing the whispers of the enemy to bring you to a place where you would murder. How do you think Cain did it? He said, sin is at the door. Sin will talk to you. He'll chat with you. And he wants to go from this to this to this to, to your brain is all out like, yo, oh my God, I got to do something about it. And that's just yourself allowing the foothold of the enemy inside your conversations. You got to understand, you got to guard your mind. You got to guard your heart. You got to guard your ears. If, it, you, if you're in a conversation that is hatred towards somebody, I'm telling you now, here's discernment one-on-one. -on -one. It's not God. Because the enemy is loud and God's whispers are quiet. And if you allow your soul to quiet down, you'll hear the whisper rather than the voice. Whew. Is that helping somebody here today? Sin is at the door and wants to master me. He wants to use me, right? He wants to be, he wants to be the puppeteer and I'm the puppet. And to carry on, to understand that the enemy needs a body to operate on earth. It's illegally to operate on earth without a body. Just like God can't operate on earth without a body, neither the devil. So the devil's looking for hosts. And the other day I was talking about to somebody, I said, yeah, but the host didn't do nothing. But like, what are you talking about? A host is someone who allows someone in and makes room. You become a host. You allow the enemy to host your life, and then he uses his characteristics through you, but you're the one paying the price. You got to understand. At the end of the day, we are responsible for everything we do, right? There's freedom of will, and we can, we, can, we can sow to the kingdom of darkness, or we can sow to the kingdom of light. At the end of the day, it's your choice. But you got to start discerning who you're listening to. You got to discern who you're listening to. So I'm going to give you three takeaways. Three takeaways on this teaching. And if you're writing down, I want you to write these three takeaways because they're so key. I mean, I go deeper in Matrix, but because of time, I'm going to just give you these three quick ones. Because understand that for you to evolve to what God has called you to do, there has to be some inner work. And that inner work has nothing to do with someone else. It has to do with you being the inner engineer to shift some things inside your heart. Because the minute you start shifting some things in your heart, your destination starts shifting somewhere else. Come on, somebody. The minute you shift this... Your destination is shifted. If you don't allow anything to happen in your heart and keep it that way, it is destined for ruins because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But when you start shifting some things and start learning some things and say, devil, I ain't got no time for your little whispers. I, when I was a child, I used to talk like a child. I used to think like a child. But now that I'm an adult, I put my childish ways behind me. You used to get me and take my lollipop when I was little. Try to take my lollipop now. That ain't happening. You ain't stealing my lollipop no more. I don't know about you, but I don't 
I got bullied and they stole my lollipop. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> they used to take my lollipop to school. Ah. But now, it's not so much the people that are, it's the enemy. And the enemy is always out to steal, kill, and destroy. He's always bullying someone that doesn't know. You ever notice how bigger people, when they, they, take, they talk to a younger child, they'll be like, but he's, they don't know anything. They're ignorant, right? And so the thing is that when we are ignorant, the enemy just prowls on that. Because if you don't know, he'll take your lollipop like nothing. You don't even know. But the reason that we come to church is so that you can learn and you can mature and your ears can change and shift so that you can see and understand that God is doing something with you, that God is for you, that he's in you, and that he, you're going to go and take the, the promises of God. And, hey, it's going to take some violence. It's okay because I'm violent. But my violence don't come in the natural. My violence comes in the spiritual. Come on, somebody. I don't play with the devil. I don't have time for him. If I'm talking to someone and start manifesting, I ain't got no time for them. In the name of Jesus, shut up. They were like, Pastor, you told them shut up. No, I, I told the entity that's, that was trying to get into this conversation to shut up. I ain't got no time for them. Right? To, to understand this is what goes on. So here's the, the three takeaways. The number one, recognize the enemy. You got to recognize if your action of what you're doing is not godly, it is not God. If, it, if it's gossiping, if it's talking about somebody, if it's ruining somebody's character, that is murder. You talking bad about somebody behind their back, that is murder. The enemy is, is doing this. And he's just going along with it. Why? Because sometimes it feels good. It feels good for the moment because the enemy always gives you something to feel good. I mean, all sin is good in a sense. It's a feeling. But we know we pay the price. Although we don't, pay the, we don't do it because we don't want to pay the price. And so he will tempt you into do something for later on you pay the price. You you get the penalties of sin. Because understand this, even though we're under grace, we're, we're still under the law of consequence. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. So don't, some people are like, oh, but some people are taking grace out of line. Look, God is not out of control. God is not getting up from the chair and be like, oh, my God, these guys down there are messed. Oh, so my God. Oh, myself, right? Oh, my God. Oh, myself. He's not standing up. He's seated. He's in control. Believe me, if there was a problem, he'll get up. But he's not getting up because everything is done. So you got to recognize who he is. You got to understand when is the enemy? When, when is it when, under anger? The Bible says in, under, in anger, do not what? Sin. Anger is an emotion that you'll do some dumb stuff and later on regret. Have you ever done anything under anger and then later on be like, que yo hice? <laughs> oh my God. Bien exagerado. <laughs> But you still, and even if you apologize, right? How many know that sometimes on the anger you say certain things? All the husbands say amen. On the anger, <laughs> on the anger you say things, they're going be like, what? No era para tanto. Like, what was I, right? I was so revved up here with what was going on in my external world that I came lashing at my wife. And she had nothing to do with the situation that's going on here. But I didn't recognize that I was in a storm and I brought that storm to my house. Come on, somebody. Woo! recognize the enemy, how he operates. If you, if you know you had a bad day, you, you, you were all revved up everywhere, you, you're at a 10. You need to bring it down. You, right? Because automatically, if anything or anyone says something when you're a 10, you take the, what, the anger and you lash it on that person. Right? Because you were revved up. You was in a huddle with self and self got you there. How could they do this? And, that, and, and the thing is that nothing, nothing had to do with your wife or, or the person that you speak to. It all happened before, but because you didn't what? Recognize the enemy. Now, now you're, you're paying for a debt. Your know, relationship is broken. Your wife don't trust you. Like, all this is going on under anger. It says, in the anger, don't not sin. You're not going get, to get away from consequence, but you couldn't abort the sin. That's the only abortion I believe in. Abort your thoughts. When she, when, when, when Eve ate from that, from the tree, she sinned way before she ate. He says, she looked at it and it looked good. She was already in. Could she abort it? Yes, we all can. We could all take a minute and a second and, okay, this sin is not going to master me. See, this is the way you got to look at it. This sin is not going to master me. I am the, I have dominion over this. And I have the ability to overcome this thought right now. And in the name of Jesus, I cast it down, right? The Bible says, take every thought captive. 
When you take something captive or someone captive, you know what the first thing you do to them? You say, where you come from? How many times do we ask ourselves, like, like, when a thought comes, you should be like, where you come from? Like, this is not of God. But we entertain it everything, and we open it up and become a host. Entra. Come in. Let's chat. Quiere comer? Juan Patelillo, let's go. And you host every thought, and you don't discern that every thought is not from God. And you're sitting there going, why is my life going in circle? It's that you're entertaining the wrong things. We have the ability to stand here and go, oh, where you come from? What's your name? Who sent you? Why are you here? What's your route? I, yeah, we're going to interrogate you right now. Get, get over here. That's taking control. You will not master me. You will not master me. When Jesus dies at the cross, he gives me the power and, and the authority. Come on, somebody. We have authority to take that thought and say, hey, who sent you? Where you come from? And you have the ability to annihilate them. That's killing giants before they're giants. It's killing a grasshopper. Because if that grasshopper gets in, it'll become a giant because you're going to be the father. You're going to be paying for the prices of what he's doing. Through you. Oh, come on, somebody. Woo! Recognize. You got to leave out of here recognizing. The minute you leave those doors here, you got to recognize what is it that's coming in my mind? What's coming in my heart? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Who is this? Oh, it's this girl. She gets me on my nerves. It's not the girl. Yeah, they have to this old. It's not the girl. It's internal issues that you haven't dealt with. There's bones inside your cell. There's bones inside your heart. There's things that you haven't dealt with. And because you have that, you have broken lenses. And all of a sudden, everybody's broken. Come on. Woo! I'm preaching this morning. Because understand... <laughs> We are to go from victory to victory, right? That's what we believe in. We are to have dominion over the enemy, right? That's what we preach about. But we think of it as a something of material. But God is saying, I need you to take the spiritual first, and then the material manifests. You're waiting for something to happen. You go, no, I already got it. That is walking by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. And we're trying to change our husband and change, but change yourself. Go into the, into the database and change yourself and watch things shift. Because the shifting is not in the other side. Come on, somebody. The shifting is inside. The shifting, you have the power and the control to go inside your heart and say, hey, they did this to me, but it's okay. I'm going to delete this. You no longer can live in my house. You got to go. Woo. Number two. Number two. <laughs> Don't feed the baby. Now, that sounds rough, right? You're like... But the baby needs milk. Like, no, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking earthly. I'm talking spiritually. Because when you feed the baby, it's to entertain thoughts that don't come from God. Look, everything that you think of, it, and you're thinking on something, and you're focusing on something, is taking energy that God gave you in the morning. His mercies are fresh every morning. He gives you this energy, and now you're taking this energy, and you're investing it and feeding it into something that later on is going to destroy you. But guess what? I have the ability to say, I'm not feeding this baby any longer. I ain't got not the, I'm not the father of this. You got to go. Don't feed the baby. And that happens every, the minute, listen, here goes, a real quick. The minute that you hear something, or the minute someone says something, and your, your heart is out of peace, you need to recognize who's operating. Because peace is the sign that something is of God. If something takes me out of the Garden of Eden, it is not God. And I'm not going to spend no time there. Quick. Quick, I'm taking that bottle out. Quick. I'm not even going to get him a bottle. How about that? I'm going to start that, baby. And I'd say the last one is I'm running on time. Let go. Why do you have so many prisoners in your jail cell? Hashtag heart. And you are feeding them and you are giving them everything. And yet they're not giving you anything. And they're running your life. They're manipulating your actions. They're manipulating the way you see things. Just let it go. Just let it go. Proverbs 
It says, good sense and discretions makes a man slow to what? To anger. And it is his honor and whose glory? His glory to overlook a transgression or an offense without seeking revenge and harboring what? Resentment. It's to your glory. Oh, I want to go to glory to glory. Here it goes. I gave, I gave you a good nugget. You want to go from glory to glory? Overlook offense. Every time you overlook an offense, you're promoting the kingdom of God and you go from glory to glory to glory, from grace to grace to grace, from faith to faith to faith. You want to keep growing? Keep overlooking, keep looking and letting it go. No, 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 I'm not feeding. No, no, no. I'm, if I'm going to meditate on something, I meditate on the word of God. I'm going to finish with this last verse. And this is awesome for you that, oh, oh yeah, but he did this and they got to pay me. Okay, here, here, here's what God says. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. I'm going to say that again. Never. You know, I looked it up in Greek, what it means. Never. How's that for deep? Never avenge yourselves. But, I, but leave the way open for God's wrath. Now, do we want wrath on people? No, it's, it, you know, pe hurt people hurt people, then it's a trail of things. But what he's trying to say here is the fact that let me be the judge and let me handle it. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know their story. Let me deal with it. It hurt you. It's okay. Forgive them like I forgave you. This is what God is saying this morning. For all the mess that you haven't even done yet, I'm going I'm to wipe that out already. But let him go and let me be the judge. You think that God is a just God? Oh, he'll handle it. It says, in scripture, it says, vengeance is mine. It says, God's wrath and his judicial righteousness. For it is written in scripture, vengeance is mine and I repay, says the Lord. I want everybody to stand up.
Oh, this week is on. This week is on. And I know God is doing something powerful. And I'm going to pray for you guys. Because there's something that happens when you gather 70, 100 people in the one room. All chasing God. Something extraordinary. And I want to break you guys because whatever hell is going to break loose is going to break loose this week. To speak up on the worst thing, that's what's going to happen. We see that year after year after year after year, the stories of people this time and this happened. Thank you for joining us today. My name is George Caban. I'm the senior pastor here at Ignite. So happy that you tuned in. I hope that this message today edified you, built you up, and encouraged you because that's what happens when we expose ourselves to the Word of God. 
And if you were so impacted that you want to accept Jesus into your life, I want to lead you in a small prayer. Could I? Great, let's go. Father, I believe you sent your son to die for me. And on the third day, he resurrected. Today, I choose to open my heart to you, come into my life, and change everything according to your will. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. <laughs> Welcome to the family. We believe if you make this confession that you are part of a family. What's your next steps? I'll tell you. The first one is you have a prayer life. Spend some time with God. In your knees, laying down, in your inner voice, speak to God. You are his son and daughter, so you have that ability to commune with him. Number two, come visit us. Yes, come visit us. I would love to meet you in person. It's something different when you come into a community of believers. The synergy is awesome. And number three, if you do visit us, connect with us through Growth Track. That's when you get to hang out with me and the other pastors and find out the heart behind the church. Find out what it is that we're passionate about. And so we thank you, we love you, and hope to see you soon.